All right. All right, so we're starting with Irvin, who claims that he's got a 700 terabyte optical disk. Now, what is this nonsense? Well, this nonsense comes from a university, uh, University of Shanghai and Singapore, who jointly worked together to create the 700 terabyte optical disk. So this is not anywhere in any store yet. Uh-huh. I have, I have grave objections to this. 700 terabytes. How can that even be possible? What would you read it with? Gamma rays? I mean... Maybe. What kind well, of... Supposedly, they use inexpensive continuous wave lasers. But the wavelength of light is big. 700 terabytes is really a lot. I have grave objections to this. I think it's just another way to get around like magnetic disks and being able to store uh, data for long periods of time. I mean, the thing about optical data, of course, is that you can store it on multiple layers, which it's can increase different wavelengths. Um, well, you can use different wavelengths, but also you can have um, the same wave, same same wavelength, uh, but have the the different pits essentially interfere with each other, creating a you know you can have it on different layers. So there's that. I mean, and but I mean that's essentially what they do with three D NAND anyway. Well, uh, not a lot of technical detail here. I'd really like to see that technical detail. But yeah, there, there's a lot of ways you can you can compress data using optical formats. Well, I'd be very interested to learn how you can compress it that much. All right, so 28. It's just like, the, it's just like the, the magnetic tapes who can hold terabytes of data. Now we can do it with well, optical. Well, the, the tapes, of course, are work on a very fundamentally different process than, than the disk. And of course, they have much more surface area than a disk. Um, yep. A disk is, is very limited. I mean, if you were to turn a tape into a you know, disk, it would be extremely long. <laughs> Yeah, Same so this thing. is 28,000 times more than a Blu-ray. That's a really big leap forward. Anyway, uh, when we get to buy one of them, I'll be impressed. All right, and then Caitlin's got, oh, Starlink finally put up their satellites. Yeah, they're done with version one of Starlink. Um, Does this mean Liz can get it and actually stop cutting out all the time? I don't, I don't know when it'll be available to everyone all the time. Uh, but right now they're at 1.0. So they have all the satellites needed to complete their constellation, which by the way is 1,584 satellites. Yes. That is a lot of satellites. They're all orbiting at about 54 degrees, um, I or 50, sorry, 53 degrees uh, to the equator. How many launches uh, did it take to do that? And how long, do you know? It took a long time. So what they would do is they would, it, it took years and, and, I'm always monitoring the most recent launches and all the recent launches have been Starlink, 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 Starlink. Every week there's a new Starlink uh, satellite chain going up and they send up like 64 at a time. Um, and of course, some of them fail once they get up there, they, they don't all work. Uh, so they have to send it much more than 1,584, but right now they have 1,584 working satellites. So now they're at 1.0 of the constellation. So mm. that's good. Wow. And you can, you, the early ones were shiny and easy to see. The later ones are darker, right? Because the astronomers complained. I, I would hope so. Uh, I do remember seeing them coming up over the horizon. Supposedly you can still see them. Uh, they, they might be a bit fainter, but. Yeah, I'd like to go out and see them. I've seen a various website saying, find out when they're passing over your area. The, the, prob the, the problem is, is that they kind of spread out over time um, to cover a larger area. When they just go up, they're of course all coming from the same rocket. So they're in this nice straight line mm -hmm. and it looks really cool. But of course, over time, they kind of spread out and do their own thing, so. But you can see the ISS anyway, right? It's nice and bright. Yes. And yeah, I was gonna suggest, if you wanna go out and see some, some space stuff, look for the ISS. It is like, it is brighter than Sirius uh, at the right time, if you catch it at the right time. And it just, when I first saw it, it looks like an airplane. Like I thought it was, an, like, is this an airplane that's just not making any sound? Um, but no, it's the ISS and it's just really bright and it just flies across the sky and it's really cool. Yeah, I got to check that out. Okay. But they're not selling service on these things yet. Uh, so, well, they've been selling beta service for a while. I don't know when anyone can just sign up and get a, get a dish. Yeah, okay. Anyway, all right. And Alan's got, oh yeah, the mystery uh, death rays. <laughs> The mystery death rays, also known as the Havana syndrome, 
which started now several years ago in which American staffers at the Cuban embassy were afflicted with this mysterious illness that involved uh, variously vertigo, profound headaches, memory loss, ringing ears, et cetera, et cetera. And at the time it got a little bit of attention, but then there were also a lot of pundits, shall we call them, giving hot takes about, well, this is some kind of psychosomatic disorder, or there's some kind of unknown virus at play, uh, or there's just a group delusion because of course, American uh, State Department employees are a very delusional group of people. Anyway, fast forward a few years, there have been multiple reports of American staffers around the world, in fact, experiencing similar symptoms. And much more recently, just in the past few months, there have been reports of uh, American um, administration employees who have come down with these symptoms on American soil. And these reports have not gotten all that much attention. This uh, article in The New Yorker, written by uh, Adam Entus, really is the best summation of the situation and the most complete one that I've come across. And there's, there's some information in here that I did not know about. Um, not only have American officials been uh, apparently targeted uh, in the US, but including one fellow who was walking, um, I think it was right by the White House from his, his job in the Trump administration. He was leaving the White House in the evening when he was attacked and had to go to the hospital for this and did not receive a definitive diagnosis because as it turns out, the CIA hasn't been very interested and the State Department haven't been very interested in pursuing this. But now there does seem to be a pattern and a lot of the suspicion is falling on uh, the Russian government, that uh, Russian intelligence agents are uh, behind this and that they are targeting American government um, officials, um, not only abroad, but in the US and even close to their homes in one instance. So this is a more widespread than is being reported. And it's also more profound too, because there's now evidence um, of many of these people suffering brain damage. Um, there are the MRIs have been done have shown loss of brain matter, in fact. So this is this is no this is no mass delusion. Uh, it's not psychosomatic. This is a very real thing. And it appears to be some kind of uh, attack on American intelligence, uh, national security, and even just regular uh, White House staffers but they haven't found the device or really verified who's doing it, right? No, and that's part of the problem is that this is some kind of unknown technology. A lot of the speculation centers around some kind of a microwave device, but it can't be very large because in at least one instance, um, what the, the White House staffer who was targeted close to her house saw a man that was um, standing across the street from her and appeared to be following her. And uh, he must have been carrying something, or at least that's what she seemed to think. So it, it must be a very small device and does not require that much energy. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get some actual fact pretty soon. I've been reading this gradually ramping up over the last year or two. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's being deployed all over the world. Um, I can't remember how many countries, but it's dozens and dozens of countries where this type of attack has occurred. Well, I don't think they'll be able to keep it secret much longer. No, no, I'm sure the truth will come out eventually. Yeah, okay, and then we're the one I found, which is of course the big one that just hit with the uh, here's New York Times article on it. Microsoft last night revealed that there's another wave of attacks from the same Russian attackers that did solar winds. Again, another supply chain, atta chain attack. This time they attacked through this email service, Constant Comment or Constant Contact, which I hear advertised everywhere. It's what everybody uses to send marketing emails, otherwise known, I think, as spam. But anyway, customer relationship management is the dignified term for that. But anyway, it's basically business email compromise. Now they can send emails from a real US agency account at Constant Contact. So they show examples of the emails from USAID 
saying that uh, there's special new documents from Donald Trump about election fraud. You better open this attachment or click on this link. And of course, that's malware. And then they own you, you know, just like SolarWinds. So what's interesting, of course, is Russians got caught doing SolarWinds and Biden said, we're going to hurt them and make them stop. And we're going to do uh, secret things. And obviously they have not been deterred. And then there's this downing of the airplane in Belarus, which has hit all the paper, which is, and, and now after that, Biden's going to have a summit with Putin. And I hear a lot of people saying, why are you propping up Putin? So our efforts to be tough with Putin and dissuade him do not seem to be having any good effect. And man, I just retweeted an article yesterday about how a bunch of European airlines are refusing to fly over Belarus anymore. And they're uh, putting sanctions over Belarus because they had a bomb threat and uh, in order to arrest this journalist on an airplane that was just going over Belarus and a bunch of people, I got, to, I don't quite get the deal. I said, no, no, you're getting it all wrong. That article is totally wrong. And they have the usual long line of strange, uh, paranoid sounding stuff saying it's all an inside job. The guy on the airplane was in on it. His own group made the fake bomb threat. It's like, well, I don't know, especially in this day of fake news and paranoid conspiracy theories, who knows? But uh, nothing's ever clear in these international matters. But anyway, apparently Russia is still, is it the same group that hacked the Democratic National Convention in 2016, <laughs> around that time, to try to put Trump in, and then did SolarWinds, and then did this. So the Russians are still vigorously messing with our internal politics. They haven't been deterred at all. And uh, we do not seem to have the ability or the will to do anything that will actually deter them. Anyway, it's not like if we put Trump back in, he'll deter them either. <laughs> we seem to just be sitting here and letting Russia punch us and doing nothing much about it. Anyway, then Liz has got a drug dealer. Yes. So this is pretty interesting. This uh, bit, apparently pretty big time drug dealer in uh, Liverpool um, got himself busted by posting a picture of himself holding um, a block of cheese in his hand, uh, palm side up on, on this service called EncroChat, which was apparently a, uh, an encrypted um, messaging service for mobile phones. Uh, I think it's defunct now um, from, what I, from what I read. Um, but apparently this, this encrypted mobile phone service wasn't, wasn't encrypted so well because the cops got a hold of this picture and, um, uh, and apparently it was used pretty much entirely by uh, criminals, uh, at least according to the British government. Uh, people uh, used by 60,000, a criminal marketplace used by 60,000 people worldwide for coordinating the distribution of illicit goods, money laundering, and plotting to kill rivals. So, um, <laughs> so he posted this picture of his hand on there and the cops were able to actually enhance the photo enough to pull his fingerprints out of the photo and bust him uh, and he got uh, like 13 years and change in prison for um, his drug dealing which I believe in Britain, you got to be moving lots and lots and lots of drugs to get a sentence that's that heavy for uh, drugs there. So pretty interesting. Uh, things you might not think would get you in trouble on, so on uh, social media. Yeah, I remember Actually. a few years ago, they said that if you take a photograph of your key ring, they can totally reproduce the keys from that. And yeah. Being able to totally this read your perfect. fingerprint off just an ordinary snapshot is another level of... Uh, Oh. Yeah, this is the first time I'd heard of something like this, so I thought it was pretty interesting. I see a lot of these things go by on Twitter, these object challenges, or just show a picture of like a lake and say, figure out where I am or something. Apparently, this is now an increasingly common thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so I guess we're back to Irvin. Oh, yeah, with the uh, missing M1 vulnerability. Yeah, so this, uh, the, the original site, for it is kind of funny. Uh, to, it's a nice, it's a funny read. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, it is possible for two applications on an M1 Mac 
to talk to one another and not use any of the normal channels of communication. So, uh, but the, the thing that the writer says is you really shouldn't be worried because there are tons of other ways that are more, uh, more dangerous that you should really be looking out for. This is one of those things that is, that can't be fixed just by, um, by software. It, it's gonna need a new revision of the silicon itself. But because there are other ways that are more successful, this this can happen. But it's not it's not something to worry about because if uh, if malware is using this, they've already gotten in and done a whole ton of other stuff ahead. Yeah, it seemed technically a little bit like Spectre and Meltdown, but in fact not as dangerous. Right. Yeah, there's just some kind of register where one process can set it and another process can read it and get like one bit out of there, one bit of information about what the other process put there. So it's, you could make a malicious program that sent data from one process to another across a security boundary. Correct. It didn't sound like you could easily use it to like snoop on a process that wasn't playing ball. No. Yeah. Uh, the, the two have to be, have to know what's, uh, what's up with each other and communicate. Yeah. So that, that's why he's saying uh, it's not, that big of a deal? Well, what it is, it's a contrived example to show that it does violate the security policy of the hardware. Right. And but therefore, the, the question is, could it somehow be exploited in a more dangerous way? It it could, but just, just as of now, it, there's other ways that are more dangerous to look out for. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's good. And it shows the general the pattern everybody's saying, which is that Macs are, you know, not all that super secure like people thought they were. Right. Yeah. All right, and VMware is apparently in yeah. trouble yet again. Again, yes, again. Uh, so the vSphere client, um, so ours, let me back up. Ars Technica has an article here about uh, a vulnerability in VMware uh, receiving a severity rating of 9.8 out of 10, which basically means, oh no, this is bad. Uh, supposedly what happened is that, well, okay. So what is vSphere? Mm -hmm. Um, basically, if you're running um, virtual machines on, on the cloud or, or professionally, uh, you're using uh, vSphere, the vSphere clients um, by VMware to essentially control those virtual machines. So it's like the, the main interface for setting it up and interacting with the virtual machines. Uh, so it's a huge backend product. Um, and now one of the benefits, of course, of working in a virtual machine and setting up virtual machines on your servers is that you have essentially a container, right? If someone gets into the virtual machine, they're not necessarily in the main um, uh, system above it. Uh, but of course, if there is a bug in, in the virtualization software that people can get into, well, then all bets are off. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, so apparently uh, the vSphere client has a plugin for doing SAN health checks uh, and they didn't properly sanitize their inputs. Uh, and so you can use that to essentially get remote code execution on these servers that are basically kind of controlling all the other servers. Sounds great. Yep, it's fun times. Sounds like a good thing to make like a pen testing project out of. Yeah, oh, this is totally gonna be on like OSCPs and on, um, if, you, if you do like hack the box, you're gonna make a hack the box out of this. I mean, this is gonna be everywhere for, for pen testers to try and, and have fun with. Yeah, yeah. So I, I assume all you have to do is update your client Supposedly. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And then Alan's got Fuchsia OS. Boy, I'd like to understand this better. I read an article. I didn't really understand it. <laughs> well, yes. Fuchsia OS is the Google's new entry into the operating space. This is a from scratch operating system. Why? Completely They've already got Android. Why would you write another whole OS? Well, I'm sure they've got some kind of business or political or security or usability reasons for writing a new operating system. Um, it's an all new operating system from the ground up. Um, and it's uh, not getting the biggest of rollouts. It's been known for a few years and it's open source. So the code is available on GitHub but this is the first time it's been deployed in a product, which is the uh, rather unglamorous Nest Hub. And apparently functionally, this Nest Hub looks just like previous versions of the Nest Hub that used 
Linux under the hood, um, down to the, the UI and everything, the experience is exactly the same. So it's a very modest rollout, but nevertheless, when you have one of the major tech companies releasing an all new operating system, this could really change the future of computing. I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Um, some interesting facts about Fuchsia, it's written in C++, not in Go, not in Rust. So I don't know if it's going to really fundamentally address some of the problems that we have in other uh, commonplace operating systems. I wouldn't but, think so, not C++, that's what they're all written in. Yeah, well, it's C++ and some assembly. Um, so yeah, it kind of makes you wonder about that. Now I'm sure they, they've written it with uh, current best practices in mind. So maybe it will be more secure, hmm. but um, well, it hasn't yeah. been used very widely and it hasn't been hacked on very much to my knowledge. So it'd be interesting to see what, uh, what comes of this, whether Google will abandon it in a couple of years like they do just about every other product <laughs> or if they actually continue to devote resources to this and somehow this becomes a major part of their, I don't know, IOT device platform or maybe even Android phones in the future. Boy, I mean, it's important news, but I, I was the manager, I would never approve this. I often talk to students about this. I mean, the cost of developing your own OS is insane. Now you have, you don't, you don't have anybody else writing patches and drivers and updates and all this stuff. You wanna to connect to the giant community. I mean. I've always said, if you, if you have product and you can't use either Windows or Linux, then you just fire the developers until you find one that will just get it done with Windows or Linux. <laughs> what are you, nuts? I mean, I mean, I always thought it would be really fun to write an operating system. I just think it would be terrible to write your own drivers. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like, why would you do that over again? And Unless they're just trying to be like Apple and say, here's, here's our entire walled garden of stuff that We'll work with our things. So if you want to use our stuff, use our uh, use these specific devices because everything else is trash to our world. Well, well, see, then there would have to be some enormous use case to justify the incredible expense going on forever. That you just there have to be some great whole line of products that really need that new OS. But I mean, even even Apple, of course, is is based on BSD. I mean, they don't yeah. even, they're not even that, that ridiculous to be like, we're going to do everything over again from scratch. I mean, oh. It's the drivers that are this, the most annoying thing. I know. Anyway, we'll see what comes of it. But I mean, I think, I think your projection is the right, Alan. In a few years, they're going to say, well, that was fun. And now we quit and we'll go back to Linux. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. And then I've got, uh, so now we're on Max. I was really pretty interested in this. There was a security report that came out listing um, malware on various devices. And um, they found that there were a similar number of total malwares on Windows and Mac now, which is surprising to me, although on Mac, they're almost all pups, potentially unwanted programs, and only a few are real infectious malware of the type we normally think. But um, this has hit the press partly because of this security report that came out, but also because Apple is being held before Congress to justify their outrageous 30% overhead. They charge everything on the Apple, uh, Apple store for apps. And they say, oh, well, we have to do that to stop all the malware, which is infecting iPhones and Macs. And they said, wait a minute, you've been advertising for decades that you mal there isn't any malware on the iPhones and Macs. And they say, oh, now there's a huge malware problem. Therefore, we have to charge 30% of everything to get the vast amount of money it's cost to us to hold back all the malware. And, uh, People are pretty suspicious about that. And so anyway, I was very interested to see not only the results of the records of how much malware there is, but also um, this Patrick Wardle guy seems to be the Mark Rusinovich of Max. He has written a free online book about Mac malware, taking it apart and analyzing it. And he has written a little suite of tools called Objective C, which I've heard of, but I never took a good look at before. This is basically sys internals for the Mac. He has five things you can install on your Mac named Oversight, Knock Knock, Lulu, Block Block, and Do Not Disturb. And these are like the Sys internals tools. They give you information about what's happening inside your Mac OS. So you can detect malware infections. So I'm very interested because, you know, we just got our workshop at DEF CON approved with Windows internals. And it looks to me like I can add a few Mac internals projects to that class and that workshop. And I'm very interested in doing that. Cool. 
I know. So now there's a free online book and there are some free tools to start looking into the Mac and seeing what malware does on the Mac. And that is very interesting. So I'll be playing with these things. Now we can get some Mac VMs. Well, that's the problem, of course. Their Mac VMs are uh, essentially impossible and highly illegal and you know, generally very annoying. But a lot of people have real Macs. But yep, that's have, an issue. I have to say some of those tools are not so great. Um, I've, I've actually downloaded and played around with all those tools and, and some of them are just basically a GUI front ends for logs. So not so spectacular, but the book, the book is really good. Um, it's well-written and uh, Patrick Wardle is continuing to expand it. And so it's, it's definitely the best single resource I've found on Mac malware. It's, it's. Well, this is great. Yeah. It sounds like you've gone quite a bit further. Neat. Anyway, I'd like to add some projects about that to my classes and begin looking at Mac malware. Anyway, and then Liz has got Orwell. And Liz is on mute. Yeah, so back to my favorite, <clears throat> back to one of my favorite topics, the um, 21st century surveillance state uh, in which we all live. So uh, the, I actually have two articles that are, are related. Um, First one is, and this actually really surprised me considering the source, but uh, it's from the uh, president of Microsoft who said that um, uh, that basically he said that life as depicted in, in 1984, the novel of uh, surveillance state dystopia, uh, could come to pass in 2024 if lawmakers don't protect the public against uh, artificial intelligence. And I think he's right. Um, I think that we are not uh, putting enough limitations on the way that um, the government and the police use this stuff. And uh, once that technology gets out, uh, it's really hard to get that cat back in the barn. Um, so we really need to be careful about what we're doing here and how we're using it. I think we need to look at what's going on in China with the uh, Uyghurs for an example of uh, how this stuff can go once it gets, uh, once it gets out of hand. Um, and speaking of which, uh, the, the other story that I have here is uh, about uh, Oracle software um, called uh, Endeka or Endeka. I'm not really sure how it's pronounced, um, but it is uh, some software that is used um, for spying on. Uh, as for they first, they used it in the. Um, Chicago protests, the pol Chicago police did um, as part of their um, tools to arrest people. Um, because uh, th so there's there's this data analytics software um, like like this Oracle makes some um, Palantir makes one of the biggest ones uh, where they track people's um, locations through phones. Um, they analyze photos with machine learning in order to um, pick out like say protesters from a, a large group picture that was taken with a drone or a surveillance camera, anything like that. Um, and then identify the people that are in it. Um, they use, they, they, they trace people's contacts to see who they're associated with and, and so on and so forth. So um, Oracle's product was used by the Chicago police um, and they bragged about that um, during the, during the uh, Black Lives Matter protest, they bragged about that. And then, uh, then as, if, if it, as if that weren't enough, uh, they went and sold it to China for um, their current campaign to, uh, well, probably more than one current campaign. I would guess they probably used it in Hong Kong as well as uh, with regard to the Uyghurs, but uh, it's pretty creepy. And I don't think that, uh, I think this is a prime example of 
uh, what the Microsoft president was talking about. We need to put some limitations in place and quickly uh, before this gets completely out of hand. Yeah, and this is not a new position of Microsoft. They've been proudly trumpeting privacy for a long time because they're trying to hurt Google. And Google makes its money by spying on you and, and targeting ads, and Microsoft doesn't. So Microsoft uh, taking a high moral stand on this is definitely in their advantage. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting to me too how much this is just creeping into our day to day, day lives, even here. Um, uh, our my, the county that I live in in California has a the the police both local police, but also the county sheriffs have, uh, they have a drone program. And I keep seeing it over my yard every night at nine o'clock. Uh, and it feels pretty damn invasive, I've got to say. Is it quiet? Uh, yeah, it's relatively quiet. That's but good because I see Ian Coldwater on Twitter saying she can't get any sleep at night because she's in Milwaukee. And they just yeah. have helicopters circling every yeah. night to uh, drive the you nuts. helicopters are pretty damn loud. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they also they also have planes, um, spy planes that are also pretty pretty loud. Uh, but it's the drones I'm seeing every night, and and it's weird because I'm out in the country, so I'm out in the suburbs, so I wouldn't. I'm not really sure why what they're looking for. Um, I have some ideas, but uh, I'm over it. <laughs> they, they probably heard that there's like a dangerous uh, hacker out there plotting yeah, probably, to overthrow the uh, government. And that's a very minor, that is a very minor example that doesn't really affect me a whole lot. Uh, this gets, this gets, uh, it's a slippery slope because, you know, we've talked about uh, other instances of the, of the use of this that are not minor and it had, people have gone to jail over it who were falsely accused before. Oh yeah. Um, and that's going to ramp up the more we continue to rely on technology like this without appropriate checks and balances. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I think uh, it's good that we got the journalists and the EFF and stuff to push back. Yeah. All right. And then we're back to Irvin with Quick. Quick is now an RFC. Hooray. Uh, Google has, has developed this. They... Um, it's how it's how things like the Chromecast avoids asking your DNS server for where is what. Um, and now it looks like it will be officially used with like HTTP three. Yeah, I, I, I knew Quick make HTTP transfers faster. Here they're saying it replaces TCP, which is not what I thought it did. Apparently, that's been the goal. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was the goal. Yeah. But it, it is the case that HTTP is really old and could be improved. And Google did it years ago just to make transfers faster. Right. And at the same time, circumventing things like ad blocking and whatnot by uh, not asking for DNS. Uh, so yeah, now it's, now it's going to be a thing. And it, I'm sure it's going to be used everywhere eventually. Yep. And of course, this is the opposite of Microsoft's privacy push. Google's push to circumvent ad blocking is, of course, their high moral high ground. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, all right. And Caitlin's got USB C. Yes. USB C is coming out with a new standard pretty soon. USB C type 2.1. Ooh, now we're really moving up in the USB era. Um, the big difference here is that uh, USB C uh, 2.1 is going to deliver up to, I believe, 48 volts of power. Let me see if I can't. Uh, let me search for that really quickly. Volts. Oh, yes, yes. So it's going up from 20 volts to 48 volts, exactly. Um, which is kind of silly because um, one of the reasons why you, you generally want to keep to low voltages is that uh, the higher voltages you go, the more likely you are to create an arc. And we, we've seen this, you plug, you have your, your plugs in the wall, you plug in a device and then you hear a pop or a bing. And what that does is it creates some corrosion on the, on the plug. Now that's not too much of a big deal. If you're talking about those big electric plugs, you, you plug into the wall, a little bit of corrosion is not gonna mess it up right away. It's, it's still pretty good. Um, the problem of course, is that USB-C connectors are very small. 
Uh, so I do not know how they're going to deal with the corrosion caused by the high voltage. I mean, ideally what you could do since it's USB-C is say, hey, request 48 volts. And then before you unplug, you sort of have to treat it like a disk drive and say, you know, stop, push the eject charger button on your PC and have it you drop the voltage. Do that, though. Yeah, who's going to do that? I mean, come on. <laughs> um, well, they, 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 they appear to be like hot pluggable like USB, but maybe they really shouldn't be. Yeah, uh, I mean, but that, that's the thing. It's just that the, the connector itself was never designed, as far as I know, to handle 48 volts. Uh, but they want to be able to deliver up to 250 watts of power. Um, and also, 250 watts of power is a lot of power. I mean, we're starting to get to the point where cyber attacks and kinetic attacks kind of are kind of being blurred. <laughs> I mean, if you can control someone's USB-C power output, um, you can do some serious damage to their PC. So. Yeah, and I, something I've learned, like I think any other serious Mac user, is these USB-Cs are not very reliable. I have a lot of trouble because they don't make good connections. You have to unplug them and replug them, and they fail and stuff. There, well, there's that. Yeah, so the, like I said, the connections really were not designed for, for that huge of power delivery. And the thing about USB-C is it sounds like a great idea to have one cable for everything. But it turns out there's a reason why we have different cables for different things. And so it used to be like if you wanted like a video cable, you would go out and get, you know, that HDMI cable, which is meant specifically for delivering that video signal. And if you wanted a power cable, you would go and get a beefy power cable, you know, that plugs into the wall or whatever. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the requirements for delivering power usually involves, you know, thicker wires, uh, be able to withstand, you know, 48 volts and not have that leak into the other um, other devices and be able to have it shielded enough, you know, to handle that kind of that kind of voltage, et cetera, et cetera. And that is very different from the requirements of the cable for, you know, fast um, data delivery, which is mostly has to do with keeping interference to a minimum. Um, and so you, you end up having to have like multiple USB cables, USB-C cables that look exactly the same. And you know you would you would think it doesn't matter, but it really does matter which cable you plug in because if you're trying to get speed, you want the USB C cable for speed and likewise for power. So, and yeah. USB C is not turning out to be as as awesome as as it, it as we all thought it could have been. Well, you know, logically, all the data connections ought to be over Bluetooth or something, but that I... doesn't seem to work so well either. I mean, Bluetooth is not as fast. It also, that too has, even though it uses, so Bluetooth, believe it or not, uses sp uh, spread spectrum frequency hopping to avoid interference, but it still gets interference, especially because it runs on the 2.4 gigahertz uh, bandwidth. So if you run your microwave in the background, I mean, Bluetooth is not gonna have as fast of a connection. Yeah, yep. And I found out the hard way, my landlord left town for like a year for the, uh the pandemic and when he came back of course nothing worked and his mac wouldn't even recognize the bluetooth keyboard anymore we had to go find a hardwired keyboard to get it going because you know if you haven't used it for a while it forgets and disconnects and won't reconnect yep so it's not yeah. as great as it should be so yeah i mean basically what we learned from USB-C is that that you know maybe all those different connectors weren't such a bad thing after all well you know <laughs> Microsoft, in the time of Windows 8, had this stupid idea that every UI should be the same on the phone and the tablet and desktop and everything. And Apple has this idea that every port should be the same. I mean, to Apple's credit, I mean, Apple has always been like, let's do our own ports. For the first time ever, they're like, let's use a standard port, USB-C. And I applaud them greatly. And I think if Apple wants to keep using USB-C, good for them. Use open standards like that. Uh, all I'm saying is that, you know, it's okay if we have a few different types of ports on our computer. We don't necessarily have to have everything the same. Yeah, I remember Saturday Night Live, they had this product that is both a floor wax and a dessert topping. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it, it reminds me of the, the, um, the Onion article where they had the one-click uh, uh, one, one Mac, MacBook. Mm -hmm. It was just a MacBook with a click wheel. And if you wanted to type, you had to go around and around and around. And, yeah. and it was to, to simplify everything. And of course, everyone was taking like two hours to like write a paragraph. You know? yep. And then, yep. you know, trying to make things too simple can sometimes backfire on you. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then Alan's got cities with microbial fingerprints. So what is yes. the deal with this? <laughs> I, I know we're still in a pandemic and maybe it's too early to be making light of viruses and bacteria, but this is a very notable 
study. It's the first large scale survey of urban biomes. What researchers did in 60 different cities around the world was they went out and swabbed uh, subway turnstiles, handrails, garbage can lids, took those samples back to the lab and then analyzed those for all the different viruses and bacteria that were present. And if you have any hypochondriac or OCD tendencies, I strongly urge you to not read this report, this study. It will disturb you greatly. They discovered 11,000 different viruses that were previously unknown and 1,300 bacteria also previously unknown. So that's a lot of viruses and bacteria that um, presumably are not highly dangerous for the most part, but that were unknown to science. And um, many, uh, many of the cities did have more or less the same bacteria and viruses. In fact, there are 31 species that are present in 97% of all samples across all 60 cities. But on the other hand, uh, each city has its own particular biome, its own particular mix of viruses and bacteria to such an extent that um, just looking at a single sample, the researchers could predict with 88% accuracy what city it was from, where that sample was taken from. Yeah. So they produced this really great website called uh, metasub.org and uh, slash map if you want really pretty graphics of all the samples they took and the mix of the bacteria and viruses that they found. And uh, well, I've been looking through it a little bit and uh, I've been looking at these different viruses and, and bacteria and I know more about Cutibacterium acnes and uh, Oxalobacteriaceae than I have any desire to. Yeah, well, you know, I people that are surprised by this, I think they didn't grow up on a farm, you know. <laughs> yeah, this right. this idea of cleanliness is one of those city slicker ideas. <laughs> yeah, but on the farm, that's good bacteria. It's good clean dirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that I've heard a lot that does make sense is to sample the sewage for evidence of like the uh, coronavirus. That's a really yes. good way to like see how many, how much it's spreading through your town. That would probably be a lot better than the stuff we're taking like the positivity rate of the people that get tested. Right, so, right. Yeah. yeah, or not only um, uh, coronavirus, but other substances too, like um, uh, yeah. you know, drugs, uh, yeah. illicit substances. Uh, yeah, it seems like a really good idea. You would know like yeah. how many people are taking heroin, all sorts of things. And it could lead to this like big brother stuff like Liz was talking about. I could be like tracking down which house is growing pot. That was an article I wanted to add today that was pretty funny. They were in Britain and they found this pot that had connected illegally to the electric grid. And they said, aha, they're growing marijuana. So they raided it and it was Bitcoin farming. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. it amounts to the same thing. So. <laughs> which should also be illegal. Well, it apparently was illegal because they were stealing the power anyway. Ah, well, that, that's, yeah, okay. Anyway, and then this one here, I was amazed. Liz last time was talking about this citizen group, and this one came out with much more information from Vice News. I didn't realize this. I thought citizen group was just where you would hire like a security guard to come like beat up a mugger. But what it is, it was originally named Vigilante. You join this group, and then they post like, find this guy, he's a criminal. And everybody goes out with their cell phone, like playing a video game and finds this criminal and like holds him and arrests him and stuff. It's to make all of you into like superheroes. And they promoted this greatly. And then they discovered uh, law enforcement people are like giving us trouble about that name vigilante. Uh, let's change the name to citizen. And then they decided to hunt down people. Like they accused some guy of like starting a fire in Los Angeles and mobilized everybody. And the guy in charge, this is how we're going to promote the app. We have to catch this guy. Go out and catch him. Offer a $10,000 reward. Offer $20,000. Offer a $30,000 reward. We're going to get him. And of course, it was the wrong guy. And then it turns out that when they have these exciting videos of people using the citizen app, arresting perps, those are in fact citizen employees pretending to be ordinary users, arresting the perps. So it's all pretty much fake, but this guy is convinced this is gonna save the world. This is like um, uh, 
And of course, people say all they're doing is like fingering anybody who is like an unpopular minority or something in the area. This guy looks suspicious. Let's all go grab him. He must be a perp. So anyway, it's uh, this apparently still growing and vigilante. He's convinced it's going to save the world. Uh, I, I foresee at least a lot of lawsuits and probably other disasters coming out of this. I mean, what, what could possibly go wrong with shifting our law enforcement from public officials to private corporations. I mean, I once saw a movie about this. It was called RoboCop and everything was fine. Yeah, I was thinking of The Purge, but yeah, it's a similar kind of thing. And the, I, especially in San Francisco now, I'm seeing a ton of articles that say a burglar will like break into your store, the cops haul him away and he's back tomorrow breaking in the same store again because our new DA doesn't, they blame, some people bring the DA, some people are blaming the cops, but the people in San Francisco are saying, I don't know whose fault it is, but the fact is nothing gets done to you when you commit crimes anymore in San Francisco. They just put you back out on the street. <laughs> so that would seem like an environment that would promote this sort of thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, what do you do about a situation like that? Because, I mean, it seems like you should, the, the, the basic answer is, you know, throw them in jail. But of course, now you're not dealing with the base issue of why they're committing crimes in the first place, just that they're committing crimes. I don't know. It's a tough issue. Yeah, yeah well, anyway. Uh, I guess one thing you could do is you could all download Citizen and form your own like vigilante force and solve all your problems. I've, uh, yeah, a, a friend of mine downloaded Citizen and then got alerts every time something happened in the city and then became a paranoid shut-in because <laughs> yes. she found out there are crimes in the city happening everywhere. <laughs> Years ago, I knew a guy that lived in Oakland and he would go jogging around like he was in Guardian Angels. But he said, hey, those guys are just crazed vigilantes. I don't want to be in them anymore. So he would go out alone and jog at midnight around Lake Merritt. And when the muggers attacked him, he would beat them up for fun, you know. Oh, so yeah, for fun, as one does. Well, yeah, you know, there's there's people that want to be superheroes, you know. Anyway, and the last one here, Eliz has something wrong with ISPs. Yeah, I, I know it's a it's a hard concept to imagine, but uh the uh, ISPs aren't always honest and above board. Uh, I know that. Hey, it ain't so, Liz. I know it's crazy, right? Uh, so I actually have not one but two stories about this this week. Um, one of them is that uh, uh, it's about Spectrum, um, and there uh, recently there was a, an emergency uh, broadband act that was passed where uh, for folks who make under a certain amount of money, um, they had to be prov provided a, um, a, low, uh, a low cost internet plan um, that basically credits them 50 bucks a month off of their bill, right? So that should be enough to get someone basic internet, but guess what? It's not. Uh, these sleazebag companies are doing whatever they can to get around this despite their record smashing profits. Uh, and one that, um, that, uh, one that, uh, Spectrum has been pulling is, uh, forcing people to agree to sign up for, um, for forcing people to sign up for, uh, a full priced package uh, after um, after the program ends that'll keep them on. And a lot of the time there are contracts involved in that, though it doesn't say here whether there are or not. Um, and uh, one that one that Verizon's been doing is putting people that qualify for this program on more expensive plans. So uh, then they've got to pay more on top of the fifty dollar credit. Just scummy sleazy stuff. Uh, and, and of course, taking advantage of the, the poorest people uh, because what do they care? Um, they know that they're gonna have fewer choices typically because uh, especially a lot of poor neighborhoods are on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, and speaking of which, the other story that I have is about charter um, and uh, this company essentially, um, this essentially, uh, I believe they're, they're the same company, Charter and Spectrum are the same, I think. 
Um, so uh, here, what's that? Are they? I believe they are. At least it says so in the second article. Uh, they must, I think they merged at some point. Um, but uh, what they're doing is, and I, I've seen evidence of this with other companies, um, which I'll talk about in a second, but what this company's doing char is charging more money for uh, slower internet on streets that have no other competition. And um, this is happening in my neighborhood. Um, I, and I know because I've compared notes with Sam on what Comcast uh, plans are available because he has Comcast. The plans that he, the plan that he has is pretty decent. Uh, what's available in my neighborhood costs exponentially more for much slower speeds and terrible quality of service. And that's because there's no competition. The only other alternative that I would have to Comcast here is even worse, an even worse DSL uh, service through AT&T. Um, it doesn't cost as much, but uh, it, it's pretty bad. And the, the speeds are just terribly slow. Um, the, the Comcast service has pretty low data caps and is extremely expensive. It's also quite slow because I, I um, tested it out. Uh, so, you know, they, these companies know that they've got people in a situation where they can just take maximum advantage. And so they do. Yeah. It affects, especially affects rural people. I know they can't get hardly any internet at all. Yeah. And I, I sure wish I could get Sonic here or monkey brains, but they don't service my area. So. Yep. And of course, that's why the companies actually have some excuse for this. I mean, the fact is, in the country, it's far more expensive to provide good service. Whereas in the city, you can like lay one cable and then 100 people will pay for it. So it's the same thing with cable TV decades ago. Sort of. But I mean, I'm in the suburbs. There's an elementary school right across the street. There's lots of homes here. And we're like five miles from downtown Berkeley, something like that. So it's not like we're really out in the boonies here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. And we'll be back on Monday. Farewell.